just want to welcome you to WEMS Virtual Space. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships here at the museum. I'm so excited for you to join us today to uh, have a spotlight talk with John Ross, the third place prize winner in Telling Tales, which is the museum's 29th annual juried exhibition. So we've got a short 15 to 20 minute talk with about five minutes for questions at the end. Um, before we get started on today's program, I just wanna remind you that on, go to the next one here, Tuesday, September 19th at noon, we're gonna have a spotlight talk focusing on Wharton Eshrick's sculpture cast in metal, including his working relationship with the Modern Art Foundry in Queens, New York during the 1960s and the technical process the founder uses to reproduce wood sculptures in bronze. Really exciting. I hope you'll sign up for that. That's free. Um, I'll also note that tickets are now available from Martha McDonald, The Wood is Singing in Color. This is a live performance by the museum's 2023 artist in residence who spent months researching in our archives before creating new movement, movement, new music, movement, and lyrics based on Eshrick's work in the 1920s and 1930s. We'll have performance dates for this in September and November. You can go on our website now and buy those tickets. I hope you will join us for this. It's very exciting. More information on these events and all future events at the museum can be found on our website. So today we've got our third and final spotlight talk, digging into Telling Tales, the museum's juried woodworking exhibition, our 29th annual. This celebrates the importance of storytelling in Warden Eshrick's life and career by featuring 25 artists whose work in wood is a testament to the power of a well-told story. You can find our talks with um, Lucia Garzon and Susie Fox on our website or YouTube page. Telling Tales um, is viewable as an online e exhibition and publication that can be purchased as a hard copy or downloaded as a digital file for free. The artworks selected for first, second, third place, and honorable mention are on display in our visitor center through August 27th. So you've got about a week more to, to spend time with some of these pieces in person. And I'm showing spreads from, from the book here. And so today we're really thrilled to have John with us to talk more about his work in the show and to share more about his creative practice. And I'll bring up work of John's while we're, we're kind of talking a little bit more about who he is. Um, John's most recent works explore human activity in natural landscapes and how people interact with the environments around them. He earned an MFA in sculpture and painting from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has been teaching sculpture for the last 27 years. He's an associate professor and chair of the art department at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. So I'll ask everyone to mute themselves if they haven't already. Um, my colleague Larissa is standing by. You can put questions in the chat box. Um, we'll try to answer them either um, during the conversation. Larissa can answer them if she knows the answers or we'll save them till the end and we'll, we'll have some conversation with John. Um, and without further ado, I'd love to start the conversation. John, we're so happy to have you here. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And I want to uh, thank uh, you, Emily and Larissa, for arranging this. And I'd also like to say that when I saw the work that was chosen alongside my entries, I was very pleased. I thought it was a ex very, very strong show. And what a, a remarkable place to have work. I was, I'm totally pleased. So thank you, everybody who had anything to do with it. Well, we're thrilled. It's 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 a it's a joy to have your work in our visitor center and I, and watching our visitors interact with it for the last um, the last little bit. I can I can you know say that's that's true for them as well. Um, I'm wondering if we can can start off chatting about. Um, the work that we've got here is Cenotaph for the Blithely Alacritus. Can you give us an overview of this piece and your process and thinking and making it? Yeah, sure. Um, my, my work has evolved into these um, <clears throat> this series of wall hanging dioramas, and it, 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 it's like um, a reversion to childhood interests in model landscapes. I mean, ever since I was in sixth grade, I 
was setting up things for my toy soldiers and cars and trains and whatnot. And, and I found that uh, building these things were very satisfying to me. And um, so this particular piece was triggered from um, a residency I did in Iceland, not in a rural area of Iceland. And being a sculptor, I couldn't bring my tools with me. But what I was able to do was with my stupid little iPhone camera, take a lot of images of these very inspirational landscapes. It was like almost for me, being a guy from Chicago, it was like like from a different planet, you know? And so I took all these images and to be honest, I mean, for a whole week after I left Iceland, I had vivid dreams about the landscape for a, for a whole mm. week. It was pretty amazing. So this one, I, I paid a lot of attention to, um, you know, human intervention and Iceland has seen um, the European um, habitation for over a thousand years. And, you know, the Vikings or the Norse, uh, they they went in there and they were hungry for the wood resource and they pretty much denuded the place, you know, and mm -hmm. so that's, and they did so in a blithely alacritous way, okay, and so yeah. this is kind of like an homage to this kind of activity, homage, maybe not the best word, but um, see a cenotaph is a memorial, for those who don't know, it's a memorial that that no one is buried under, It's it's a memorial just to Call, bring forth uh, memory. So that's mm. how, this, how this piece all came together. And, you know, the other thing I thought about is the gestation period for these works are very long, like months, sometimes years. And so before this piece completely gelled or in course of it, I, I'd read um, Richard Power's book, The Overstory, which was profound. Mm. And it's about human inter interactions, significant interactions with trees and those sorts of biomes and he did a really good job of uh, including all these different demographics and ethnic groups and their um interactions and um with the trees and the the bulk the big um takeaway for me is i developed more empathy for trees like i needed that you know it always was a tree mm -hmm. hugger but here i was like totally in you know and so <clears throat> that's part of the thing that those are the things that fed into this work that we're looking at here. I mean, I think it's so interesting. So we've got the story of your trip. We've got the story of the, the sort of use of natural resources in this place. And then you've got this literal story, this this book, where, um, so, you know, first of all, it's a perfect fit for, for telling tales, where we're looking at the power of storytelling and art making, but we've got lots of different ways into and influence from different kinds of stories and storytelling. And so I'm curious if you can can tell us a little bit more about how you see storytelling as a part of your broader artistic practice. Sure. Um, let me just start by saying that I was in a show maybe 10 years ago and I did an artist talk and this was at the, a museum, a local museum. I did an artist talk mm -hmm. and, you know, and I have a way of like spouting off about the works and maybe I'm overly generous because one person came up to me and said you know I really wish you wouldn't have told me so much about this because they were <laughs> they loved the co-authorship they loved the mm. mystery and so this is something I pass on on my students I say well okay you have to decide how much you want uh, the work itself to say and how much you want to write about it or talk about it okay so when it gets into storytelling you know, my works vary quite a bit. Some are uh, purposely mysterious to allow that co-authorship co and interaction. So, you know, to various degrees, there's a story. I mean, there's always a story. Mm. And sometimes it's more of like a story like, okay, these scales I'm using came from working in a factory when I was 19 years old, that kind of, that kind of thing, you know. So not necessarily like a a narrative with a beginning and an end. It's, you know, it's just basically information. Um, and I look at all these things as like a distillate of experience. So, you know, mm. we, we all have these unique um, ways of distilling our visual life that come out in my case through my artwork. And, you know, I guess those are the ways I, the, the stories come out in the work. I don't know if that occluded your, your question or answered it. I'm not quite sure, but. Well, I, I think you answered it, right? That, that 
story storytelling can be really important in your work, even if you're not telling a specific story. If you're trying to invite the viewer into that kind of shared practice, and then you know you've got these stories as inspiration, but it doesn't have to be the story that the visitor takes away from the piece. Sure. Yeah, they're going to bring That's their own I'm... experience to to it, no matter what I say or do or how I title it. You know, the, the information in these works can be interpreted, you know, in a myriad of different ways. So. Mm. so I'm curious if you can tell me, uh, you know, a little bit more about your relationship to wood and what brought you to working with with the material, your approach to the material. Yeah, sure. Um, as an undergrad, I was. Um, my degree was a dual path in industrial arts education and in art education. So I was qualified and trained to be a, what they called a shop teacher. Back in the olden days, they had those things called a shop teacher. And so mm -hmm. when I started manipulating wood in those classes, um, I really took to it. And um, then uh, as an undergrad, I also was able to rebuild a um, old rowboat that belonged to my aunt. She bought it in 1932. And so I learned how to manipulate uh, steam bending processes and then pieces of cedar and oak and elm. And it was just fascinating. And, you know, I like the dirt associated with woodworking. I prefer sawdust to greasy metal. Um, mm. It's very manageable. And uh, wood also is very unique. You cut open a, one log, two different logs of the same species, and you're going to get different information. So it always has lots to uh, to surprise you with. Mm. So it's a it's a material that kind of gives you new things every time you work with it. Is what I'm hearing. That's right, you say. and it, it also has a mind of its own. Anybody who's ever worked a piece of wood know that there's this thing called seasonal movement that can really uh, uh, surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> Larissa, Larissa is smiling. She knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'd love to show folks the the other piece that was juried into the exhibition, but is not on view in the visitor center. It is in in the catalog, and I'm hoping you can can talk a little bit about about this piece as well, um, Anthropocene Reliquary. Okay. Um, the Anthropocene <laughs> has been such a such a hot concept and topic and uh right. especially in art making over the last couple of years so it's interesting right. to see it emerge here in your work well resource issues um human impact on the planet those those are recurring themes in my work and this this one is pretty overtly so um what we're looking at here this found bone i was told by somebody that knows that it is the femur from a seal and i found it mm. on in on a beach in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. And, you know, I, I just thought it was a very interesting form. And I, I've had it for maybe 10 years and kicking around in my studio and I never really knew what to do about it. And so but it was always in the back of my mind somewhere. And so basically it was, this whole thing was triggered by my uh, uh, visit to Iceland again, my time there. So we're looking at a glacial lagoon that uh, you know where the the glacier breaks off into these pieces and then this was adjacent uh, the ocean so these they're called bergy bits iceberg bits will flow off into the ocean there and so using crushed coal is what this mound is um also is kind of like a reference to you know one of the resources that we can't let go of and mm. so the the yeah basically that's it So tell me a little bit about, you know, your connection to Wharton Eshrick and the studio and the work. Um, I'm curious about, you know, you were, we had the pleasure of meeting you coming out here to spend time in the studio for um, the opening for the exhibition. But, you know, I'm curious how you first encountered it and what was it about the work that first interested you? Sure. Um, um, one of my students ha had her parents visit uh, the art department and introduce them to me and they live in Malvern, I guess. And so mm -hmm. when I got to talking to them, the father said, well, have you ever heard of this guy, Wharton Eshrick? And I said, no. And he told me enough to really pique my interest. And of course, 
internet enabled me to just find all this information and see images of the house and the work. And I said, oh, yeah. And then this thing happened where there was a call that, whoa, I could use another show. And, you know, I would love to go up there and see this place. And so basically that's it. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm very satisfied about the outcome. You know, so here I am talking about this stuff. It's great. Yeah. So Eshrick, Eshrick is, is new to you. So tell me, tell me about um, coming into the studio for the first time. And, and oh, I was what, gobsmacked. What... Yeah. So, you know, to see this, um, I think a lot about this is Isamu Noguchi quote. He goes uh, something to the effect like, everything is sculpture. Any idea without hindrance, any material born into space is sculpture. And so Asher mm. really had that. He goes, so, you know, he looked at his house and everything as large scale sculpture, I would say. Like, I mean, architecture is large scale sculpture. And he, I think he took that to uh, to to a very high degree and so th th there were no constraints no hindrance and so that all that appealed to me it's almost it's like okay this guy let his freak flag fly a <laughs> fine example to us all you know and I just wish I could mm -hmm. bring all my students up there to see what visionary work is like well well we're Anytime you want to bring students by, I know we had a lot of your your students and and uh, come out for the opening, so we're we're happy to have them. Um, before we open it up to questions from the folks who are on the chat with us, so think about your questions now if you might have them for John. I'd love to know a little bit about what you're really excited about in your work right now. Well, right now I'm working on a piece where I'm going to be utilizing. Uh, brass wool and lead mm. foil. So here's a bit of a departure from wood, but there's a sumptuousness to both those materials that I'm trying to utilize. So I, I get excited about materials like um, the one I finished this spring. There's no images of it, but I, I, I found this stuff called um, aqua resin. It, it handles just mm. like a fiberglass resin uh, or an epoxy, but it's uh, toxic toxicity is very low and so me being kind of a tree hugger and, and thinking about environmental impacts this stuff is pretty exciting so I get excited about these materials and to, in keeping my practice new and interesting to myself I always set up challenges for my work utilizing this material so that is mm. the you know that that's what keeps this you know I'm never going to retire from this let's put it that way so <laughs> There's, there's always the next problem to solve, especially if you continue, continue yeah. to make problems for yourself to solve, right? It, it, will, it will go on forever. <laughs> you know, I, I like to think I'm getting better at it. And so I, I talk to my students a lot when they when they come in, in the 200 level class. I, I talk about this gulf and the gulf is what mm. they envision or even draw on paper and what they can actually execute. And so... The, the difference between what's in their mind and what they end up with is this gulf. And so as they develop skills, hopefully this gulf is less of a chasm and more of a, a little leap. And that's, mm. a, that's the ongoing challenge for me going at this as a lifelong interest. You're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're making the gap smaller and keeping yourself, um, I'm but keeping also the, Keeping, keeping the vision big, too, at the same time, it sounds like. Well, John, I'd love to thank you for sharing with us so generously. I'm going to um, stop the share on the images, and I'd love to open it up for questions that people might have for John. You can feel free to unmute yourself and and ask a question of, of John, who is here to, to share some more time with us if, if folks have questions. Anybody? Yes, I see Pat. Yeah. Just yourself and out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, less of a question, but more my response to your work. Um, at first, it, I my mind brought up Anselm Kiefer, the painter, and his art is similar to yours in in many ways, but I find it overwhelming. 
you know, it's probably farther out in the future than yours is, you know, it's, it's apocalyptic is what you see. And, um, but what struck me about yours was, first of all, it made this looming catastrophe more accessible for me. And I think when you shared about your experience in sixth grade of making models, I think it, it reaches that inner child in me that's afraid, you know, and so I find that really helpful and surprising. I didn't expect to have that experience. The other thing that it it made me think of was, and this is my Catholic background, is they the the um, framework that you put around the photograph reminds me of the stations of the cross that is usually around the perimeter of a church. And that's about the suffering of Christ. And I'm thinking that I just love that 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 image came to me because this is the suffering of our world, you know, put in a way that I think we can hold in 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 a manageable context. So um, so I appreciate your work. I um, I really yeah. love it. And um, thank you. Uh, thank you for doing it. I appreciate your comments. So the um, these uh, containers, these um, wooden constructs that hold that are partly influenced by seeing um, uh, tombs and memorials and grottos uh, and various different cultures, their, their cemetery practices. So, and plus my, my old man was a preacher. So I've been around this kind of architecture quite a bit. Mm. Thank you, Pat. Do we do we have anyone? We have time for about one more question. If anyone has one or or comment, I'll ask. I'll ask that last one then. John, can you tell us what's going on behind you? I love that you've come with with your work framing <laughs> framing you. We've got the, the sort of halo of um, a diorama light. <laughs> Uh, so this piece here is called the uh, Enabled Romantic Affliction. And um, this goes back, I think, to uh, things that my father inculcated me with was the love of the natural environment, the romance mm -hmm. of the, the North Woods, the cabin in the woods. And um, that, so I thought a lot about him as I made this. And so the central form here is uh, my own version of Lincoln Logs, which I played with when I was a kid. <laughs> and um, it was interesting as I built this, I, I even put music on that he uh, turned me on to. Like I had some Mozart that I played and uh, I thought about the different species of trees as I made them. And uh, mm. it's like uh, the, the romantic mean being the opposite of the practical. And so my affinity to these environments is a very impractical thing, especially in the finance, the financial aspects of it. But it's like, it's this imperative that can't be denied for me. Mm. So this is almost like a shrine. And it's also a little bit of a history of me as a maker because I've included this uh, little uh, Lincoln log cabin that I made. Yeah, we can. We, we've got Lincoln Logs as the the gateway drug to to a life spent working and thinking about wood, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> gateway drug. I love that Lincoln Logs as gateway drug. <laughs> I think it probably is for a lot of kids who yeah. who yeah. you know hold those in their hand and feel some kind of connection to the material and start to think, what else can this do? Well, John, I want to thank you so much for sharing about your practice and about your work with us today. And thank you for sharing your work with the community at WEM through the publication, the website, and um, uh, the piece in the Visitor Center. I will encourage folks that they have not had a chance to come see the work in person. You've got about a week left. So um, hurry yourself over to the Warden Escher Museum. and. John, I hope that this will not be the last time that that we'll we'll get to connect and collaborate with you. Well, I feel the same way. And again, thank you very much. I appreciated uh, all my whole experience. I enjoyed it. Thank you. So, uh, folks, here we often uh, have a little tradition where if people want to unmute themselves and say 
say a goodbye as they're as they're heading out back into your day. I hope this has been um, a wonderful little bit of art in the middle of <laughs> whatever else you have happening. And um, we'll see you again soon on on the virtual space or in person at WEM. Thank you.